Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our webinar series. My name is Cody Niedermeyer, and I'm an associate at BFG Financial Advisors and a CFP candidate. And today we're going to be talking about creative strategies to paying off student loans and other forms of debt. And we have a reoccurring guest who's been on, I believe, the last few times. We have Lena Nebel joining us, who's one of the principals at BFG. And she has over 20 uh, years of experience in the field, and we are more than delighted to have you return, Lena. Thanks for keep inviting me back. I appreciate it. <laughs> keep doing a great job. You're going to keep coming back. But once again, just thank you. Uh, appreciate you making the time to uh, to join us today. But without further ado, I think uh, everyone wants to see the fun disclosure slide, and uh, we'll get this thing going. When people think of debt, mm -hmm. is all debt bad? No. Not necessarily. I mean, I think it it really depends on the interest rate, the purpose of the debt. Um, no, but there's there's good debt and bad debt. Okay, I I feel like debt is uh, it's almost a bad word in our industry where it, it makes a lot of people turn in their seat when they think about debt or trying to get rid of debt um, or anything kind of along those lines. So, I guess building off of that, what are you know the different kinds of debt that people take on on a daily basis? Yeah, I think uh, to your comment about in our industry, you know, people kind of don't like the the term debt and mm -hmm. everything it's because you you owe something, right? You owe somebody yeah. something and it's a payment that you're going to have. Um, so it can make people very stressful. Uh, there are a few different types of debt. So I thought I would, uh, we can kind of talk about some of the basic forms of debt, the more popular ones. Um, the first one is obviously house debt. So there can be a variety of debts that you can take off of uh, real estate, whether it's primary residence, a vacation home, a second home, an investment property. Um, but typically you have uh, that mortgage for the purchase of that property. You may have a mortgage because you refinance another debt as well. Um, one of our webinars that we recently had was mm -hmm. about purchasing a home. So we spent a lot of time talking about the different types of mortgages. For So for our listeners out there um, who didn't get a chance to hear that webinar, uh, shameless plug, go please. <laughs> the other webinar about the, uh, the, the house purchase. Um, there's also loans that you can take to get the equity out of your house. So they're typically called a, a home equity loan or a home equity line of credit. Okay. So the biggest differences between those two is a loan is a fixed interest rate for a fixed time period where a line of credit is a variable debt. So on okay. the variable debt, as interest rates increase, that uh, payment is going to increase as well. Um, there's also tax benefits related to both of those. I think we'll probably cover that in a little bit later. Um, but those are, again, the, the main types of, of loans off of a house. Uh, you then have credit card debt. Obviously, credit card debt is one of the popular forms of debt. It's also the ones that people get in the most trouble for. Uh, a lot of people nowadays use credit cards to fund all their purchases, and then they pay it off every month. Um, it's an efficient way to budget and spend your money with the assumption that credit cards are going to get paid off each month. Um, a lot of people do it this way because they're getting cash back or airline points or some type of meaningful rewards. Uh, we have clients that will actually pay for college tuition on their credit card to get those points, and then they'll use whether it's the 529 wow. or their savings to, to pay that off. Um, other individuals use credit cards to you know, purchase items. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about at that last webinar was all of the ancillary expenses you have when purchasing a house. So you think of furniture, um, you know, you can go to Lazy Boy Furniture and get 0% for 24 months. And so what that means is that when you purchase that furniture, you don't have any interest that you're paying on during that time period, those 24 months. So if there is a balance left over at that time period, all of the interest that has accumulated is now due. So a lot of people forget that um, that payment is then due on that 24 month, but that all of the interest that has been accumulating, not just what is going to start on that next month. Um, oh. So that deferring of that interest could be pretty substantial, which is why you would want to have it all paid off by the time that interest expires. Hmm. Um, Interesting. But again, like I said, you know, this is the type of debt that that can get people in trouble because it's easily you can apply for it super easy, get approved and everything. People will say, well, I'll pay it off next month or when I get my tax refund or when I get my bonus. But there's always something that changes. Um, so it's better to just you know try and pay it off each month. 
a car loans. Car loans, another popular form of debt. A lot of people have, have car loans um, depending on their finances. They may put money down on that car loan to be able to keep the interest rate down or keep, yeah. keep the payment down. They may extend the length of the loan to keep the payment down, which ends up costing them more in interest. You know, you, you never want to go to a dealership and say, I can afford $300 a month of a car payment because they may show you a seven year loan in doing that mm -hmm. versus maybe taking a three or a five year loan. So um, again, car loans, you want to make sure that you're, you're chopping the best interest rate. Dealerships aren't the only places that you can get a car loan. You could go mm -hmm. to your credit union or to your bank. Um, there are used car loan rates and new car loan rates. Used car rates typically have higher interest rate. Um, so keep that in mind if you're looking at used versus new. Um, there's also a 401k loan, which I would recommend against using the 401k as a, a means to, to, um, to purchase something. And, you know, this would be a, a, a last resort because you basically are removing working capital. And in the end, it could possibly push you farther behind in retirement because you're basically wow. playing catch up. Um, mm -hmm. But how a 401k loan works is you can take a loan out. Uh, you would not pay any taxes or penalty. It doesn't even show up on your credit report. Huh. You pay yourself the interest back, so you're not paying a lender. Um, but if you leave your job, let's say in the second year after taking that loan, some employer plans, you have to pay it back within 90 days. And if that's wow. the case, you're going to then have taxes and penalty on that distribution. So just be careful if you decide to take out a mm -hmm. 401k loan. Um, it's always advisable to speak with a financial advisor or a representative from the 401k provider if that's something that you're thinking of doing. Um, and then lastly, we have student loans. Um, and obviously student loans are, are used to um, be able to pay for college costs. Most individuals these days have to take student loans just because of the skyrocketing cost of, um, of college education. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get a private loan, which is typically through a bank, uh, could have a high interest rate. Um, there's also subsidized versus unsubsidized loans, which are government loans. Subsidized loans don't accrue interest, whereas unsubsidized loans do. Um, so what that means is that <clears throat> when you're in school, you, that interest is not accumulating on that subsidized loan. Um, so that can help to lower your payments once that once you graduate college and have to start um, repaying. You can defer both loan payments uh, until graduation. You're not required to start paying on it. Um, but again, the unsubsidized loans may have a larger payment because that interest has been accumulating all through your college uh, college career. Um, obviously, student loans have been in the news a lot lately due to just the various stimulus um, packages that have come out since COVID. Recently, as in last week, um, the administration has actually extended the deferral of student loan payments until January 31st. They were set to expire in September, so we've pushed them off again. Um, so th again, therefore, individuals who receive, um, they've been doing the suspension of the loan payments. Um, they may also be uh, eligible for a 0% interest rate during that time period. Um, and like most loans, it's up to you to contact the provider to see what options you have. They're not going to automatically tell you some of the, the plans that you can have. Um, but if you have good cash flow, it may make sense for you to continue those payments if you can get a lower rate if you're eligible for that. Um, so just because you can turn off the payments, just because the lender is allowing you to suspend the payments, doesn't necessarily mean that you should. If you have good cash flow, you have a steady job, you can make those payments, get rid of the debt and continue to make those payments even if it was suspended. So those again, those are what I would say are kind of the, the main forms of debt, the popular forms of debt. And then um, as we go through it, you know, I think we'll be able to kind of go through a more detail of which is good and which is bad, which should we pay off? Yep, yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, to no surprise, we're already actually receiving a few questions about loan forgiveness. And do we have any idea kind of what to expect or how much of my loans will be forgiven and i think a lot of that is just still up on the in the air and we're we're kind of waiting on decisions from the government about the plan with that but they just kind of keep pushing off the interest accruing is that right absolutely yeah so it, it is right now we just keep extending the deadline of yeah. when people can begin repaying again not all loans are eligible so you want to yeah. make sure that you have that as well as the zero percent and everything um so we'll see what happens in january on, on mm -hmm. what's going to be extended and, and what 
options. You know, there's been a lot of different, um, uh, um, I want to say, packages that have been put out there regarding yeah. if you want to forgive 10,000, 20,000, all. Um, so again, everything's kind of up in the air right now. Yeah, a lot of more questions than we have answers at the moment, but it's definitely something we're keeping an eye on. Um, but I think you you hit the nail on the head with you know those main types of debt uh, in that discussion. But and you kind of briefly talked about each one of these with this as well. But you know what's the big idea of you know why do people take on debt? Um, I, I think a, a better question is you mm -hmm. know why don't we just take it out of savings? Why can't I just take all my money out of the Good bank and, and put it to a car? So you know as we kind of went through house car student loans those all have specific purposes right you're buying a house you're buying a car you're going to college um but why don't we just pay for it out of cash flow why have to take on debt um and the easy answer is most people can't afford it most people can't afford to take that amount of money or they may not have that amount of money so they're borrowing that they're using somebody else's money and they're going to be subjected to a certain time period on paying it back and, and a certain amount of interest. Um, so keeping that money in the bank or starting to accumulate savings um, is usually the better option um, than you know, just paying for it all outright. Um, you know, one of our jobs as a certified financial planner is to do a comparison of taking money out um, or taking a loan. So quite often we'll run those scenarios you know, should I pay for this out of pocket? Uh, you know, especially for a new house. If we're selling one house, should I take a mortgage on the new house? Or should I put all those proceeds on that new property? Um, it's very, very common. Um, so again, a lot. another big question that people have is, should I carry this debt as I'm going into retirement? And I would love to see all retirees not have any of those, those loan payments, not have those expenses. But quite honestly, if you have a car loan that's at 0%, I'd rather you use that than take money out of your investments that hopefully are doing better than 0%. So rather use somebody else's money that's that's free. So mm -hmm. um, that's really the the main reason people take money and people take loans is mm -hmm. because they're trying to rebuild savings or they're trying to build savings. Um, so uh, it's very common and, and that's not a bad thing to take out debt. You just want to make sure that you're keeping your interest manageable and most importantly that that you're able to afford that debt as well okay yeah no that makes that makes a lot of sense and i think builds into you know when and why is it important to paying off debt and i might be jumping ahead but you know to my knowledge and please correct me if i'm wrong uh you know there's two kind of big forms of the idea of you know a debt reduction plan or you know planning on reducing your debt and there's one idea it's called the snowball effect and that's when you're starting off with paying off that lowest balance owed debt first. And it kind of, it builds up confidence and, you know, you attack that one, then you direct those payments to the next one and you kind of build up that way. And there's also the avalanche uh, method, which is you attack the one with the highest interest rate first. And by doing that, the idea is, you know, you're going to be paying off the ones with the highest interest, therefore, you know, saving money in the long term on those interest payments. Yeah, I, I agree with both of those. Um, I, I love both of those strategies and how I would present one option versus the other really comes down to the client's behavior towards debt payoff, right? So okay. if it's something that's stressing them out and they just want to start cleaning it up, um, doing the snowball approach may be the best one. Just yeah. lowest balance, I'm able to knock that one out, you feel better. And then, like you said, you have confidence and you just kind of keep that momentum going. Um, we, you know, had a client you and I had been um, working on who yep. put together a debt reduction plan and, and we did the avalanche one is we looked at the highest interest rate first and started working that way um, because mm -hmm. with their way on how they could pay things down, that was the best option for them. Um, one of the things we talked about at the, the last webinar too was about the debt to income ratio. So yep. sometimes an individual must pay off certain types of debt before they can accumulate other debt. So regardless of the strategy that you want, a lender may be saying, I need you to pay this loan off over here. So that may be a reason to pay off um, one debt versus another debt. Um, if somebody received an inheritance or a bonus, uh, that would be motivation to start paying off some different debts and everything. And then of course, 
there's always a situation where um, interest rates are variable and in the environment that we're in right now, interest rates are expected to increase. So we may wanna pay down that higher interest rate or, or the variable interest rate. So again, could be a, could be a time period. Um, or it could be a time period based upon the interest rates. And then you have yeah. time period based upon if there's a balloon payment on that loan. So okay. what a balloon payment is, uh, you could have a loan that is amortized over 10 years, mm -hmm. which means that your payment is calculated off of a 10 year loan, but there's a balloon in the seventh year, which means that the loan has to be paid off in that seventh year. Okay. Benefit of doing that, of having a loan for let's say amortized over 10 with a balloon of seven is because the payment is lower. So for individuals that may have tight cash flow your first few years, but later on you think it'll ease up to where you can take on that balloon payment, Again, that may be a good way to structure a loan. It all depends on your personal situation, but that balloon payment would tell you, okay, I need to attack that debt as well. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the mentality of having, uh, taking out a, a longer term loan, but maybe treating it like a shorter term loan. So mm -hmm. when clients say, should I get a 15 year mortgage or a 30 year mortgage? The benefit of a 30 year mortgage is it can keep your, your payment low, and you can pay it like a 15 year, but if something happens to your job or your cash flow, you have that flexibility to go back to that 30 year loan payment. So how you initially structure the debt could also help with cash flow too. Uh, and again, while we're talking about mortgages, the other types of mortgages are the adjustable rate mortgage. Yep. So an adjustable rate mortgage, these are loans where the interest rates adjust at some point in the future and they can go pretty high. So for, for individuals who took out um, an ARM adjustable rate mortgage a few years ago. And if it's coming due this year or next year, mm -hmm. it's going to jump up. So you have to be careful uh, to understand the rules of how high that ARM can go, especially in an environment where there's a interest rate increase. So that may dictate wanting to, wanting to pay some debts off sooner rather than later. So quite honestly, it's just looking at the total debt picture Mm -hmm. and going through all of the analysis of their individual situation, looking into the crystal ball to see where interest rates are going, projecting cash flow, and then really start having a game plan on what to attack first. And sometimes, like I said, it's out of our control, whether they're applying for a different type of loan and the lender wants them to, to pay off something first, or they're contractually obligated to pay it off at a certain time period. So it's important to understand um, all those variables associated with it. Yeah, and I mean, briefly in the last few minutes, we talked about several different variables that I'm sure some people are scratching their heads while they're watching this webinar right now, trying to get everything organized. And it just shows, you know, another benefit of having a financial planner to kind of break everything down with you, uh, kind of explain the rationale behind the debt reduction plan and kind of working together in order to, uh, to reduce that outstanding debt. And then uh, it leads once again into the next slide of, you know, does it matter which debt I pay first? And the ideas that you've mentioned above, you know, just building on those with even more variables, right? Absolutely. And um, I, I can't stress it enough. You know, if you're working with a financial planner, they should be examining all the debt and, and coming yeah. up with a, a payment plan. Um, you know, I would say the rule of thumb is to pay the, the higher interest rate first. You know, that's kind of the, the rule of thumb. But mm -hmm. as I mentioned, you want to take that into context of, of everything else. Um, there's okay. also tax benefits that are part of the overall uh, debt structure that, that we'll talk about. Um, and there could be options to refinance and consolidate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in kind of talking about, you know, one of those clients that we helped come up with a debt payment strategy. Um, by paying off one debt, we can then use the payments they were making on that one debt and add it to the to another loan mm -hmm. and start paying that off. And, and I think of that as almost like a snowball, right? If, I, yeah. if I'm paying off something where I was used to paying $200 a month on that debt, then I take that $200 and I apply it to another one. I'm kind of doubling down on my payments. And then you really can start paying things off much quicker. So in that situation, you know, we were uh, projecting it would take about three years for him to be debt free on kind of the bad debt, right? It was okay yeah. to keep the 0% car loan. It was okay to keep the mortgage, but all the other debt we wanted cleaned up. Um, and that's the biggest thing is it takes time. The debt didn't occur overnight. It, and if you're disciplined and you have patience, 
the debt will be eliminated. But I think some people just get so bogged down and stressed and they think that they're never going to get out from it. Um, come up with a plan, stick to it, and you'll feel much better. But it does take time. Uh, doing it, doing a balance transfer on different credit cards is always an option to a low to a low interest rate. If there's not a balance transfer fee, always pay attention to the fine details. Uh, yeah. Most people aren't aware of this, but you, if you have let's say a high interest credit card that you're not paying off every month, you can actually call the credit card company and ask if they have a lower interest rate available. Not to apply for a new card, but it's like calling Verizon and negotiating your FIOS bill. Are there any specials that you're running right now? They're not going to call you to tell you how you can save money. You have to be your own advocate and reach out to them. So let's say you have a credit card balance and it's at 16%. Maybe they're able to, able to lower that rate to 10% or 6% for a mm -hmm. certain time period. What that means is that more of your payments are going to principal. More of your payments are able to start paying down that credit card. So that's important to to be able to, um, to to look at that. Additionally, if you lost your job or you had a reduction in income, even before the different COVID rules regarding uh, debt payments, uh, call your credit card company. You could actually negotiate to try to get a hardship. So you could negotiate either your balance, your interest, your payment plan, mm -hmm. and depending on the situation, they can work with you. Just keep in mind if they forgive a portion of the debt, you may have to claim that as income on your taxes but okay. don't feel like there's no hope out there. Uh, work with your credit card company, work with your lender on those options. And then of course, the last option is bankruptcy. Yeah. Bankruptcy is never one that you know we want to be able to use. It's the last resort where all other options have been exhausted. Um, yeah. The reason being is you know, you're limited. The reason why I wouldn't always recommend bankruptcy is you're limited to how much you can keep in your name and assets. Um, it creates a credit report, you know, for your year, for years uh, that it's just not advantageous for you. So before you go down the path of filing for bankruptcy, see what other options you have, um, see what other agencies you can work with, like a debt consolidation agency mm -hmm. and things like that um, to be able to help. And if bankruptcy is the last resort to clean everything up, it's best to work with a bankruptcy attorney who knows all the laws, knows yeah. everything that you need to do, going through that paperwork, the record keeping and, and everything else. Um, but again, it, you know, it does matter which debts you pay off first, but it, it really comes back to just sticking to a plan and being patient with it. Yeah, um, commitment to the plan is the one thing that we see finds our clients most successful, especially when they're working through it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, you bring up the case in point of touching on bankruptcy, that is, a subject that we could have several webinars bring on of course an attorney that's specific in the field um, but is a last resort um, you know let's say you're in one of these situations where you do have that debt and you know you're looking for every resource you can possibly fl uh, find to help you pay it off you know can employers actually help with student loans uh, actually, they can. There was uh, it was a few years ago. The IRS has actually allowed employers to offer matching of student loan payments in lieu of a 401k match, but wow. it's up to the employer to offer that. So for okay. some individuals, some young individuals who are just starting in their career, they come out of college with some student loan debt. Instead of having the employer do a 401k match, they may request, "Can you help me pay off my student loan?" And that will get that loan paid off quicker and still giving that young employee time to build a 401k. So um, talking to the benefits coordinator at your employer, understanding um, all those benefits. And again, while I'm talking about it, shameless plug for next month, I think we're going to be talking about um, benefits as we get into open enrollment yeah. season. And these are one of those benefits a lot of people overlook on what their employer can offer. So yes, uh, to answer your question, and, and it's not just employers actually, hmm. states actually have assistance on being able to pay off um, student loans. So uh, Maryland, where our office is located, um, there's actually what's called a student loan debt relief program. It allows yeah. individuals who went to a Maryland college and have student loans to be able to um, receive a credit to be able to help pay pay down your student loan and oh, wow. paperwork you go through and you could receive um, a, you know, a couple thousand dollars on helping to put towards your student loan. Uh, we have a lot of clients in Texas, 
Texas has a public service loan forgiveness program um, for their state employees that after a required term of 10 years, whatever balance is left on that loan, it's forgiven. So there's really? an option in Texas. Uh, the federal government actually has a program that allows um, the agencies to make up uh, about $10,000 of student loan payments per year. So we have a lot of clients whose children are going to college and they apply through the Office of Personnel Management and they get $10,000 a year to apply towards their student loan. Um, of course, with everything, you have to be eligible, you have to file paperwork. Mm -hmm. um, I know our contact information will be provided at the end of the yeah. webinar. So for any individuals who are interested in, in getting additional information, send us an email and I'll, I can send you the links to you know, these different programs. But you have to look for it, right? So if you're in the state of California, you know, maybe there's something in California that's available for you. Um, that's one of the reasons I love having all of um, you know, our team built of certified financial planners because it allows all of us to have experience and knowledge and do research and kind of um, spread our area so we can kind of cover in different states and understand uh, the rules that apply to them. So both employers and states can help to contribute towards that student loan payoff. Yeah, and like you said, the resources are out there. It's just, you gotta go find them. But let's say we utilized all of those resources. You know, we have uh, we have our debt reduction plan. We, we figured out our employer has helped with a little bit of the debt, but there's still some outstanding and, you know, we can't afford to make those payments. Uh, what are some steps that we can take uh, in order to tackle this debt that's, you know, we feel like we're drowning in? Yeah, I mean, that that's when tough decisions have to be made. You know, you have yeah. to look at cutting your expenses. Um, as I mentioned, bankruptcy is a last resort. Should you go through credit counseling? Do you need to borrow money from a friend or a family member, which can be tricky um, yeah. in doing that and emotional? Um, but again, that's that's when tough decisions have to be made. Um, ideally, those decisions are made before that debt is even taken. Uh, that's the tough part about our job, quite honestly. It's telling people if they can't afford something that they've been wanting to do, but you have to do the due diligence. You have to make sure that you can make this purchase. So for some individuals, they want to purchase a, a $750,000 house, but they can only afford a $500,000 house. So you may have to look into a different county, or you may have to give up certain things on that wish list for a house. Um, or you just have to save longer to be able mm -hmm. to do that. But if you're already in that situation and maybe through no fault of your own, you've, you've lost a job or other things have happened, um, you gotta have to you have to make tough decisions. You have to cut expenses in different area, or as a last resort, that's where you're where you're looking at with bankruptcy. Um, but I'm very confident in saying if you develop a plan, if you utilize all these other resources that we talked about, um, that should help you, even though. Um, you still may feel very overwhelmed. Hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel when you map out how long it may take you to pay off certain debts or what other adjustments can be made. Even if it's just a couple dollars, you know, you, you look at your cell phone bill or your utilities and there's, there's all these little add-ons that happen, right? There could be yes. an, a monthly insurance protection plan or Maybe you're you're buying additional services for your TV that everybody does streaming now. So do I even need cable? Saving thirty or fifty dollars a month it adds up over time, and that money can be applied to other things. But you have to go through the exercise and the energy to try to find some of those savings. Yeah. And you brought up the point of you know maybe borrowing money from a friend or a family member. Uh, I think that's just an important one to touch on. Of should I? Hey, you know I'll pay you back whenever. Or, you know, when you're in those situations, uh, should you get something prepared legally, like a document or something, just to kind of cover all the bases and not not try to let something like that come in between you? Always have a legal document. Yep. Always have a legal document. For the reason you just said, don't let it come between you. Don't let it be a thing. Yeah. Um, if you don't have the legal document and if you say, I'll get back to you when I get my tax refund or my bonus mm -hmm. and then those things don't happen, it's tough. Uh, yeah. More people may feel more inclined to be able to loan you money if there is some type of legal agreement to. So yeah. it's not enjoyable to have to go through that process, but legal documents are the best way. Yeah, that water is a little murky, but I just wanted to make sure we uh, we definitely buckled down on that one because it's a resource that people reach out to, especially as a last resort. Um, right. 
So that was a little bit on the downer side. Let's, uh, you know, there are some tax benefits when you do yes. have a loan. Uh, so getting to the last few slides, I definitely want to uh, want to get this information out to everybody of, you know, what are some of those tax benefits to having a loan? Right. Um, so I'll absolutely put that disclaimer out. I am not a CPA as no. we're going to be talking about the tax benefits. So with tax advice, we always recommend you consult with an accountant. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'll go over the the basic and more okay. popular debts with the tax impact, but as it applies to your situation, work with the CPA or, and they can run scenarios and everything. Um, so finishing up with student loans, you used to be able to deduct the interest off of your mm -hmm. tax return. Uh, it was up to a certain amount. You were phased out based upon your income, but with recent tax law changes, you no longer can deduct student loan interest. So that may be a motivation on wanting to pay that off quicker because you're not receiving any benefit um, okay. tax-wise like you used to. Mortgages, interest on your house debt, uh, that's gone through a lot of changes over these past couple of years. So a mortgage is only deductible up to $750,000 of that balance. So if let's say you purchased a house uh, and you took a mortgage for $800,000, only the interest up to $750,000 of that balance is deductible. So you can imagine when that tax law changed, um, the form 1098, which is what you use to put on your tax return to show how much interest you're claiming, uh, it had to be expanded to record the outstanding balance, the date that your loan was taken, and other items that the lender is now required to report. So of course, when the lender is required to report more, it means that you have higher fees. And of course, that's part of all those fees that you pay at settlement. So mortgage is still deductible, but up to a certain extent. Uh, the home equity loans that we talked about in the past, mm -hmm. you could take out your home equity loan for anything that you want, and you could deduct that interest for anything. So if you were using it to pay for college loans, mm -hmm. for a car purchase, or for home improvements, you could deduct all that interest. But now you can only deduct the home equity loan interest if it's used to improve the value of your home. So if you're you're doing painting, carpeting, you add a deck, you add a pool, um, kitchen upgrade, that can all be deductible. But okay. it's up to the taxpayer to be honest and record how those funds were used. The lender is not required to report that to the IRS as of now. Okay. Uh, you can, as it relates to the house, you can actually deduct points on your tax return. So points are fees paid to uh, the lender in, at closing in exchange for reducing the rate. So this is usually called buying down the rate, which can lower your monthly mortgage payments, but it requires more upfront money from you. And you can deduct those, uh, those points. And that's typically done in either a refinance or on your uh, initial mortgage. But keep in mind, all the interests that we're talking about that you can yeah. deduct can only happen when you itemize your tax return. So if you just take a standard deduction, all that interest that we talked about, it doesn't matter because you're not even able to, to itemize your return. So for some people, they're now motivated to pay off their mortgages, their home equity loans, mm -hmm. because they're not claiming any of that interest. Now, um, with the new administration, they're talking about changing the rules as it relates to mortgages again and what you can and can't do so that may kind of change our recommendations and rules overall uh, credit cards and car loans no tax impact okay. you you don't have um, any availability on receiving a deduction for anything now with that said if you are a small business owner and you have a car there's certain car expenses that you can deduct off of your tax return I'll leave those conversations to the accountant to kind of go into detail. Uh, yeah. But as far as the, the interest on your standard uh, tax return, credit cards and car loans, there's, there's no tax benefit. So maybe it would be smart to pay those off first, depending on the interest rates and, and your individual situation. Yeah, that's our favorite answer of it depends. Right. You know? <laughs> that <laughs> should just be the why. name of uh, your, the webinar show. It depends. Yeah, it might need to get changed. But, um, you know, if if we really had to take one thing from talking about debt and student loans and, you know, everything that we've talked about today, uh, what should our listeners or viewers, you know, take away from this? You know, debt and money is it's always emotional. 
right? So anytime you're talking about finances, we're always talking about emotions. So I would say, remember to stay calm, focus on creating some type of debt reduction plan, try and get assistance in doing that and stick to it. It's like diet and exercise. If you're consistent, you stick to it. And when you see the results, it gets you motivated to continue to do it. So going back to your snowball versus avalanche strategies, that may be one to where, you know, I'm just going to pay one off. It feels good to be done with it. So Mm -hmm. have a plan in place. It'll be far easier to get out of debt than not having a plan at all. And, you know, for those listeners that, you know, I make a plan and I can't stick to it, or, you know, where do I even begin to make the plan? Um, You know, where's the resources to find people to help? Um, I think they're all over. So there, yeah. there's a few different ways. You know, one of the things that um, I think about when working out is accountability. So yes. possibly having an accountability partner, whether it's you know your significant other, and as you pay things off, you can kind of reward each other. Um, if you're using a financial advisor, they can be checking in with you to see how you're progressing along. If you're using different apps that are out there where you can actually see it uh, taking effect and everything as well. There's Mm -hmm. also credit counseling agencies that can work with you. Also looking at your employer benefits. They have different types of financial wellness programs. Um, That's one of the things that our company is very successful with Mm -hmm. is going into different corporations and developing their financial wellness program to where we can sit with the employees and talk about a plan for them. So if your company has some type of financial wellness program, that would be a resource as well. Yeah. And, you know, we can be a resource here too. And that's what the barcode is on this screen. Um, If you actually take a picture of this, you get to schedule a free consultation with one of our lead advisors. It actually could be you, Lena, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we can be a resource for you to to try to help you take the right steps towards uh, coming after that debt uh, that's accumulated over time. Um, there's been a couple questions throughout this, and I've actually written a few down myself um, throughout the presentation, but um, you briefly touched on credit cards. Uh, are there better credit cards than other credit cards out there? We talked about maybe you know consolidating and cha- uh, moving the balance, or you said maybe we use uh, credit cards for the points. You know, Maybe I want to be a traveler. Maybe I want to get on a plane. Maybe not now with COVID, but right. <laughs> uh, are, do you have any recommendations on certain credit cards out there? So it depends first on what's the purpose of the credit card. Is the purpose of the credit card because you have um, a balance on another card that you're trying to reduce the interest rate on? So you're going to look at credit cards that have a zero or a very low balance transfer option. And then you can go to the credit card companies and find out which options they have with no annual fee, either zero or minimal balance transfer options or balance transfer fees. Um, and then again, a 0%. So one credit card you may want to look at because I have a large balance and I need to attack this and I need to have a low interest rate so that my debt isn't accumulating. That would be one goal. Another okay. goal is, Cody, you say, well, I pay my credit card off every month. Mm-hmm. What do I want more? Do I want the cash back or do I want the mileage? Um, for frequent travelers, again, not as much, but for frequent travelers, they're going to use, let's say, their Southwest card. I'm always on Southwest. Okay. or I always travel and stay at a Marriott and I want my Marriott points. So think about the places that you frequent a lot and then also look to see, okay, well, what's the cash back that they're getting? Um, For our household, we use one credit card for all of our expenses because we get cash back. I like the flexibility of having that cash back. I like getting that check and then I can use that check for anything. I'm not required to use it on an airplane or use it in a hotel or go to the reward mall that's online that a lot of these credit card companies have and pick different gift cards and everything. So you have to use what's, you know, what works in your personal situation. Uh, and there are a lot of different options out there. And that's what you yeah. have to determine of, do I want low interest rate, cashback, miles, rewards? What's the best one for you? Awesome. And then I think I got one more question that was actually from a few people and Oh, one person tuned in late, but uh, just the question about spending down the emergency fund again, or what we call the emergency fund and using that savings to pay off the high interest debts. Could you just reiterate exactly, you know, the idea behind, you know, you don't want to do that because, you know, you don't know what else 
could come up in your world where you you need that emergency fund. You said it perfectly. I mean, that's the whole benefit of having the emergency reserve is in case there's an emergency. So if you spend that down and then an emergency happens, guess what? You're using your credit card again and you're back to square one and that's not helpful. So we have to think of other options besides yeah. using that emergency fund. Yeah, And it's it's easy when you're already in the debt hole to dig it deeper rather than dig yourself out. So it just reiterates, you know, having that plan and sticking to it. But uh, once again, listeners, um, viewers, everybody that's tuned in today, uh, first off, thank you. But if you take a picture of this barcode, you get that free consultation. Or if you actually, Lena, I believe we have your information on here. If you guys have any specific questions, uh, you want to reach out to Lena specifically, uh, you can give her an email. Uh, her email is right there. And or give the office a call and we can set up a quick phone call. But um, no, we really, really appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, our next webinar is actually going to be on September 8th. And Lena, you are gracing us with your presence one more time. And I believe you uh, you did the shameless plug, I believe is how you referred to it earlier. Of We're going to be discussing uh, understanding your employee benefit package, which I think lines up perfectly in the year where there's a lot of companies out there who your employee benefit elections and everything kind of goes on around this time. So once again, that's going to be September 8th. And Lena, thank you so much for joining us again. We can't hate, wait to have you back in a few weeks. And then uh, maybe we'll give you a break, but you just keep doing such a good job that I keep bringing you back. Thanks, Carrie. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. And uh, last thing, thank you everybody for tuning in. We'll, uh, we'll catch you during our next webinar. Thanks. Take care.